Father, in Jesus' name, we pray that as we look at these uh, two beatitudes, two ideas, what it means to be poor in spirit and what it means to mourn, that you would allow us to do both tonight, to be humble uh, and to recognize that you bring honor to those who are humble and then you resist the proud. Um, but allow us to recognize there's a whole lot of hope in that humility and in that honor as well. I pray that you do more of a work in my heart than anybody else is in this room. I pray that you would uh, display whatever you need to display in order for people to know that you are here. I pray that you let it be known that you're God and that I'm your servant, that I've spoken all these things according to your word. I pray that the questions that have been asked in the privacy of bedrooms, uh, staring in the mirror in bathrooms, uh, driving down the road, uh, contemplating life, I pray that you would answer those questions tonight. Uh, I pray that you would say things that only you could know, that the people who hear them must immediately know that it's your Holy Spirit speaking. Uh, and I pray most of all that you would um, turn our hearts back toward you. You would let it be known that you are God all throughout the world, not just at Geneva, not just in uh, Beaver Falls, not just in Pennsylvania, but in all the world. We pray that you would be known. And we pray that in the great and strong name of Jesus. Amen. Some of you who were here last year, I heard my story, uh, heard our story about my son Judah, who uh, even when I left the house today, Judah is still laying in a bed. Uh, currently, the Lord has slowed down his seizure count, which is great. He was having uh, hundreds a day, and now we're seeing less than five a day, which is um, a medical miracle in many ways. Yet and still, uh, he's still not the little five-year-old boy that I knew two years ago running around and um, saying that the Lord wills. In fact, we have seven kids and my daughter, Charity, whose birthday is tomorrow, um, sounds exactly like Judah sounded right before uh, he went to the hospital. And so every single moment of every single day that she's speaking, I have these flashbacks and reminders of Judah um, playing around and running around the house. And so as you can imagine, that's difficult. Um, because on one hand, I'm looking at my beautiful little daughter and trying to enjoy that moment. At the same time, I'm thinking of everything that I've lost uh, in Judah and thinking about where Judah would be. Judah will be eight, if the Lord wills, in December. And so this has been uh, an almost three-year-long stint of just watching him be where he is. And so um, when I talked to Caleb and he said, hey, we're doing the Beatitudes and you got blessed are the, uh, those who mourn and blessed uh, are the poor in spirit, I just thought, how appropriate, God, thanks, appreciate it. Um, because if he would have asked me to preach that before June 1st, 2017, I'm sure I would have come and said something. Um, but now it's a whole different deal. It's an absolute different deal. And so the way that I'm going to start this message, I tell you, uh, if you got a Bible, I'm going to probably go to six or seven different passages. Uh, but the way that I want to start this message is, is what the Lord has taught me in Matthew chapter 5, so that it's helpful so you understand the context there. Then I want to talk to you about the gospel of Saturday. So let me go through Matthew 5 real quick. Just these small verses. It's the Sermon on the Mount, famous sermon uh, from Jesus. And in verses 3 and 4, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed is the word that means happy. And so he says, happy are the poor in spirit. Poor means impoverished and spirit. You know what it means. So he basically says, happy are the spiritual beggars. That's the way that you can think about it. The people who are spiritually begging are the people who should be happy. Um, and then he tells us why. Because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is really God's reign and his rule. It is God's absolute, sovereign, providential rule in all times, in all spaces, with all people. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all who live in it. Psalm chapter 24, verse 1 says. And so then he says, blessed are those who mourn. That means to lament, to cry, to be hurt, to be deeply sorrowful. Um, and so it reminds me of a poem that says, I walked a mile with pleasure and she chatted all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow and not a word said she, but oh, the things I learned from sorrow when sorrow walked with me. And so blessed are those who mourn. Why? Because they will be comforted. That word comforted means to call alongside. Someone will be coming alongside them. Strength will come to them. All right. So now that you have at least what do those two beatitudes mean, um, I want to take you a little bit deeper into what I mean by the gospel of Saturday. If you know anything about your Bible uh, and you know anything about even just tradition, we know that we celebrate Good Friday right before we celebrate Easter. 
And so there's Friday, there's Saturday, and there's Sunday. Well, Friday is the day that Jesus dies. And when Jesus dies, I need you to recognize if you are a disciple, if you were a disciple, you had given three years of your entire life following this person that all of a sudden you see hanging on a cross, you see with no power, you see incredibly vulnerable, and now you've given up your entire life to follow after this dude that you are now seeing get beat on, whipped, mocked, and is not saying anything. In fact, uh, the only disciple left at the cross when Jesus dies is John. Everybody else had deserted him. And so uh, if you remember the story of Peter, Peter denies him three times, and then he goes out and he weeps bitterly. But what I want you to recognize is when Saturday morning comes, it's not Sunday yet. And so all of your faith that you have put into this person, Jesus, all that you heard him say, if you tear down this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. All of these things, you've watched him heal the sick. You've watched him raise the dead. And now he's dead. And that Saturday, all day long, all you have to contemplate is, I watched him get arrested. I watched him beat on him. I watched him hang him on a cross. I watched him nail. And I watched him die. And it's Saturday. Saturday is where we live. You know that Jesus said he would rise, but in Saturday, Peter hadn't seen him rise yet. James hadn't seen him rise yet. John hadn't seen him rise yet. All they know is the Jesus that they followed for three years is dead. And the way that we live in today's world is really living in that gospel of Saturday. Do we know Jesus rose? Sure, we have that story in the text. But if I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't see Jesus rise. I didn't see him live. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. Do I have a promise that Jesus will return? Absolutely. Has he returned yet? No. So all of my faith is in the gospel of Saturday. I don't know. Like, I know I'm standing here if this stuff is true, but that's where I put all of my eggs in that basket. I put the entire weight of who I am in that basket. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if we only have hope in this life, in Christ, we of all people are most miserable. Because what Paul is saying is, yo, I could have been doing something else. I could have I mean, I've given up my entire life for this. As Caleb and I were talking today, the Gospel of Saturday um, being poor in spirit, being a spiritual beggar, lamenting and being a person who mourns makes you long for heaven. It makes you long for something different. And I can tell you, if I'm going to be completely honest, before Judah got sick, I did not long for heaven like I long for heaven now. In fact, uh, as my wife and I are in counseling, one day he asked me if, if, if I thought I was suicidal. And I said, I don't think I'm suicidal, but I certainly don't want to be here. I mean, if I didn't make it home on the way home by way of a car accident, hallelujah. Like, let's make it happen. Let's go home fast as we can. So he gave me the clinical signs to see if you were suicidal. Nobody leaves thinking that I'm suicidal because I don't think I'm suicidal. I think instead I have been disappointed by this earth the way that every Christian should be disappointed with what the earth has to offer. But part of the reason we're not is because we buy the lie that Christianity is about earth being the cake and heaven is just the icing on top. When the reality is, earth is the place that's not home. And so many of us put our stock and weight here, but that's not where we should put our stock and weight. So uh, I said all of that to give you context for what I'm about to communicate from a bunch of different passages. Sometimes when we read something like, happy are the spiritual beggars or blessed are the poor in spirit, we go, how can the poor in spirit, how can spiritual beggars be happy? How does that make any sense? Can I take you to some scriptures where Jesus would have gotten this from? I mean, he died, so he wrote it. But y'all know what I'm saying. I want to show you some other places where scripture says similar things. Can I do that? Cool. Turn your Bible quickly to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. If you don't turn there, you don't have to. I'm going to read it to you either way. This is what the Word of God says in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, beginning verse 1. A good name is better than a good ointment, and the day of one's death, listen, the day of one's death is better than, than the day of one's birth. I'm just going to pause for a second. Let that sink in. The day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. If you read that and immediately you thought, how in the world is that true? I'm here to tell you, you probably love earth way more than you should. Because I can tell you now, looking at my son Judah day to day, I understand what this is. And I'm like, absolutely, that's true. Long for death way more than I long for life at this point. It is better to go, go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting. In other words, he's saying it's better to go to a funeral than to go to a wedding. It's better to go to somewhere like a cemetery than to go to a party. 
Then he gives us the why. Because that is the end of every man, and the living takes it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for when a face is sad, a heart may be made happy. The mind of the wise is in the house of mourning, while the mind of fools is in the house of pleasure. When I read something like that, and I hear Jesus say, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are spiritual beggars. What Jesus is getting at, what Ecclesiastes chapter 7 is getting at is, we can be hoodwinked and bamboozled by what this earth has to offer. We can begin to think that this is home and this is a great place to live and there aren't a whole lot of problems. If you are holding heaven at arm's length because you love the way that earth feels to you, likely you have made earth an idol that's not home. And so instead of being a spiritual beggar, you likely have become, while you are spiritually impoverished because the humility is not there, and while you think that you are growing in wisdom and while you think you are growing in spiritual poverty, you probably are going in what I like to call spiritual obesity. And the reason I call it spiritual obesity is you're not exercising, you're not walking out the things that God tells you to walk out because as you live according to what his word says, earth loses its luster very, very quickly. I think if you asked Isaiah, hey, do you want to walk around naked for three years? He'd say, no, that's what God called him to do. I think if you asked Hosea, Hosea, do you want to marry Goma because she's a prostitute? I think his answer would be no. And if I went to marriage counseling, they'd tell me not to do the same thing, but God called me to. But the more I grow as a Christian, the more I'm learning that God calls us to impossible things in order that he might get glory. But a lot of those things are not things that we jump in at and wanted to do. So one of the ways I learn whether or not I'm doing God's will is I ask the question, is this something I would do anyway without him? And when the answer is yes, often I find, at least for me, that it may not be him telling me to do it. However, when it's something that is really, really simple, that I have no reason not to do it, and I still don't want to do it, likely that's him. So I want to take you to another passage that says something very similar. James chapter 1, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time here. If you heard in my prayer, the three things that the Lord has put on my heart that I want to hopefully indelibly imprint on yours is that being poor in spirit, a spiritual beggar, and being um, a person who mourns, who laments, brings a whole lot of humility. And humility can be defined a whole lot of ways. Uh, I think it was Philip Brooks who said, it's not thinking less of yourself. It's instead taking who you are and stacking it up against every competitor you can think of, God included. It's take all your greatness, you put it against the greatness of every other person, and you see the true greatness of your smallness. Um, another way to think of it is living in the full weight of who you are, knowing exactly who you are and then being able to live in with self-possession for who you really authentically are in and of yourself. The Bible teaches that God gives grace to the humble, but the Bible says that he resists the proud. In fact, I'm reading through the book of Judges right now, and every time the Bible says and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, the Lord would actually empower other foreign nations against his own people. Is he a good father and a guiding light and a great defender? Absolutely. But he cares and loves you so much, he doesn't want you to live in pride. So he's willing to empower your enemies to keep you humble. I'm going to prove that with 2 Corinthians chapter 12 in just a few minutes. But I want to stay in John, James chapter 1. Y'all getting raw thoughts, so it ain't going to be ordered. So if you expected this to be ordered, it's not going to be ordered. This is completely raw. All right? James chapter 1, this is what the Word of God says, and I want to just read, uh, starting in verse 9. Let the brother of humble circumstances glory in his high position. Christianity is counterintuitive, and it's counterintuitive, isn't it? I mean, he said, let the person in humble circumstances. So that's the person who's poor, the person who doesn't have much, the person who doesn't have a lot of friends, the person who's not wealthy, the person who's not attractive, the person who's not impressive. At this moment, I'm thinking Isaiah 53, so I got to say this because I think the Lord wants me to. When you read Isaiah 53, the Bible says there was no beauty nor comeliness about this Messiah, this one that would come, that would make us desire him. But instead, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows who was acquainted with suffering. So you can imagine that when Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus has lived that. He's not just somebody talking. And there are some of us who are scared to death to be poor in spirit, and we're scared to death to mourn. We're scared to death to lament. Fact is, when we think of lament, we only think of Hurricane Dorian, tornadoes, somebody dying. That's the kind of thing. We don't think about the lament of our own brokenness. We don't think about the lament of our own pride. We don't think about the lament that there are people walking all over this campus that are hurting, cutting themselves, and all kind of stuff. We don't even want to know. What we do instead is seek to keep our head down 
never ask questions so that we can make ourselves look a little bit better in front of the Lord and say, hey, I'm doing the right thing. But we never really let him get real close to our hearts. Notice verse 10, let the rich man glory in his humiliation. Counterintuitive. Because like the flowering grass, he will pass away for the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass and it flowers, its flowers fall off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. What James is basically saying is we can do all that we can on this earth to think that life is fun and we can amass all that we want to. At the end of the day, one out of one die. And so the person in humble circumstances already longs to not be here. The person in rich circumstances is a whole lot harder for them. They like being here because it's comfortable. We'll go to Luke chapter 18 in just a second. I want to do it now. Remind me if I don't. Uh, verse 12, blessed is a man who per perseveres under trial. For once he has been proven, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So I'm a, I'm a, so this time he says, because uh, remember, all of this is God's word. Blessed is one who perseveres under trial. So think about that. We hear in the scriptures that the person who perseveres under trial, the person who is a spiritual beggar, the person who laments, who mourns, who weeps, and who cries is the person who ultimately will be blessed. Why? Because it brings about a humility. It brings about an understanding of our smallness. Now, turn your Bible to Luke 18. I got to go there since I just said it. Um, and I believe the Lord wants me to go there right now. And I just want to remind all of us of what God says throughout his word. In Luke chapter 18, you might know the rich young ruler story. And instead of focusing on the rich young ruler story, I'm going to focus on what happens right after. The rich young ruler is very sad because of what he hears, because he's extremely rich. Y'all know what? when we hear extremely rich, we immediately go to money. We don't go to friendships. We don't go to knowledge and wisdom. We don't go to the things that we can do well. We don't go to any of that stuff. We just immediately turn to money and we go, well, my bank account is not as big as somebody else's, so I must not, this don't fit me. You can be rich in many other ways. The person that's poor in spirit doesn't have to be poor in finances to be poor in spirit. And the person who mourns doesn't have to have somebody dead in order to mourn. The reality is they can understand that death is just real and possible and God did not want it to be that way. And they can lament and say no to the death that they see. Death in scripture just means separation. So it doesn't always mean the spirit separating from the body and you're then lifeless. Death can look a lot of ways. I watch a lot of Shark Tank. And if you watch Shark Tank, you know Mr. Wonderful Kevin O'Leary says you're dead to me. And when he says you're dead to me, he does not mean you're no longer living. What he means is I'm separated from you. If you ask me for help, I'm not going to help you. It, your, your existence is irrelevant. I don't know about you, but some of us have some dead relationships with people. Some of us is our parents. Some of us is siblings. Some of us is people that we used to know. Some of us is friends. There can be death in a whole lot of ways. And so in this passage, Jesus says in verse 24, how hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Peter then says, who then can be saved? But he said the things impossible with men are possible with God. What Jesus is essentially saying is, and you probably have caught it through everything else I've said, when you got a lot of stuff, it's a whole lot harder to see where you're missing something. So if you got a lot of friends and a lot of good relationships, if you are somebody that everybody wants to be around, if you're somebody that has resources, whatever resources means, it might be a whole lot harder for you to see the gospel. Fact is, it might be even easier for you to think just because you are not doing what you want 100% of the time that you're doing what's right. I don't know if y'all grew up in Christian homes like I did, but I grew up in a Christian home. And so I thought living for Jesus meant you're not having sex, you're not smoking, and you're not drinking. You read your Bible like every once in a while. But you're not doing what the world is doing. You don't listen to secular music except for that favorite song that everybody's listening to. And who can't listen to that? That's what, that's what I thought Christianity was. That's what I thought living for Jesus meant. As I grow as a Christian, the more I grow as a Christian, the more and more I go, man, like Christianity is crazy. I mean, like it's just crazy. And I completely understand if you're looking at me right now and you're going, why do you think Christianity is crazy? Keep on living. Please live for Jesus. You live for Jesus. I'm telling you, you can get to a point where you're like, 
hey, this is nuts. Because he'd be telling you to do stuff at times that you're just like, I don't even know why you're telling me to do that or what that means. Heard a couple of stories like that tonight. I just want you to know that the beauty of the humility that it brings, I told you that I would prove what I said before in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Will y'all go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 with me real quick? I told you you would need a Bible. This is all raw thoughts that the Lord has given to me in some structure as he's walked with me over the last two years. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, this is Paul, the Apostle Paul, who has had an experience with God that he talks about in this experience, all the things that God has done. But I need, I need to hear what he says. We all need to hear what he says. Um, verse 7, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger from Satan to buffet me to keep me from exalting myself. Now, I don't know about you, but if the thorn was given to him and the thorn was a messenger of Satan, that thorn was a gift. And, and the thorn, the whole reason for the thorn, the whole reason for the messenger of Satan to beat on him was to keep him from being exalted. In other words, to keep him humble. I'm here to tell you, Satan does not want you to be humble. So then in turn, who does this gift come from? God. God graciously gives to Paul whatever this thorn is in order to keep him humble, in order to keep him a spiritual beggar, in order to keep him with some level of lament. And when I look at my life with Judah, as much as I want God to heal my little boy so he can be running around again, I know for a fact that if he's healed, it would be very easy for me to go spiritually asleep again. I know when things are really, really good, it's a whole lot easier for me to go to sleep spiritually. I can think that I'm doing the same stuff. I've been sharing this story everywhere I go because it's just true. I don't know if this happens to you. This has happened to me many times uh, where I will go to sleep somewhere, but everything I see when I'm asleep is exactly how it was when I was awake. And if you've never done that, I've done it driving, unfortunately. I've done it sitting down talking to my kids where, like, I'm in the room sitting on the couch talking to my kids. I'm asleep. I have no clue. Because in my dreams, everything that I'm seeing looks exactly the same. And then something rudely awakens me, whether that's a child screaming, uh, Asher will come and pull on my ears or grab my head and shake it. And then all of a sudden I recognize that I'm asleep. I'm just here to tell you sometimes God's going to do that in your life. And I can tell you that's what he did with me with my son Judah. I had no clue I was spiritually asleep. No clue. Because everything looked the same. I was still in my word. I was still a Christian camp director. I still was loving my wife. I still was loving my kids. What I began to recognize, and the only way I knew I was asleep, is God did something I wasn't expecting. And at the moment he did what I wasn't expecting, I was mad that he did it. That let me know I was asleep. And there's some of us in this room right now, spiritually zonked out, asleep, you have no clue. And you're wondering why every time you read the word, you ain't getting nothing. I'm telling you, because you sleep. Life is way easier when you're asleep. The dreams are what you make them at times. And so Paul says, concerning this, I begged of the Lord three times that he might, that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for pow power is perfected in weakness. So being poor in spirit, being a spiritual beggar, mourning and lament, those things bring us humility, but they also bring us honor. And honor that is unexplainable, but an honor that is so graciously given by God. Now, if I'm going to be completely honest with you, it's not the honor that we want. Like, we want an honor that people will see. We want something that we do in loving kindness to go viral, and then we be on some, you know, show, and then we make money, and then we got people who we always wanted to be on speed dial. Like, that's what we want. The type of honor that God gives, God gives is often the complete opposite of that. Like, not only are you not known publicly or in some wide array, you're known even less than what, you, than what you thought. Even the friends that you had often desert you. If you don't believe me, you can read the book of Job and you'll see that. I don't know how many of you have ever gone through a hard season that when you go through a hard season, it seems like God vacuums everybody out of your life and you feel like you are absolutely 100% alone. 
Sometimes I think he does that so that we can lament, so that we can mourn, because many of us don't otherwise. Think about this. In life, half of the stuff that we go through, we can change. Like you got a headache, you can go take Excedrin, Tylenol, Aleve, take your pick. You got a cold, you can go get some NyQuil and you can, you can knock yourself out. I, I don't take a whole lot of medicine or anything. When it gets really bad, though, T. Pope will go take two Advil PMs and sleep for like 13 hours straight. And because I don't take a lot of medicine, that's how it affects my body. But think about this. If I got a headache or I'm feeling sick and I can knock myself out like that, man, I can get away from pain anytime I want to. I'm always amazed when I hear Tylenol, one step closer to a pain-free life. Like, that's legit. Like life is painful, but we do everything we can to escape every single pain that we can. And in doing so, we become more and more numb. So I remember once upon a time, because uh, I love basketball, uh, at one point, you know how athletes will get shots? Um, or if you've done this yourself, if you've taken ibuprofen before you've played a game and you know that you injured, but you take the ibuprofen, so then you don't remember that you injured because you don't feel the pain. Anybody ever done that? Y'all know what I'm talking about? But you don't recognize that you just damaging whatever it was more. You just can't feel it. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Reminds me of a story. I now have to tell the story because it came to mind. Uh, when I was 24 years old, um, I had my first surgery, and it's been my last surgery by God's grace. Um, as far as I know, other than this pinky that is real crooked, I have, I have no broken bones. Um, and I ain't been to the doctor to know, which is a spiritual parallel in and of itself. Anyway, <laughs> 24 years old, I go to the doctor. Um, doctor checks me out. I was getting a physical because my wife asked me to go to the doctor because she thought something was wrong with me just because I hadn't been to the doctor in years. And so, go to the doctor. Doctor tells me I have a hernia, an inguinal hernia. I say, word. He says, how long have you had it? I said, I don't know, man. All my life, as far as I know, I've never known anything different than the way my body feels and looks. I said, what do we need to do? He said, well, right now it's not a problem. As long as it's not a problem, it's not a problem, right? So I'm like, all right, cool. Then we'll need to do nothing. He said, well, it's an easy fix, though. So why wouldn't you do something? I was like, what do you mean by easy? He said, oh, I just get you an appointment, and it takes about 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Let's make it happen. So he makes me an appointment. I go to the appointment. Dude looks at me. He says, oh, yeah, we can get this fixed. You just got to go through surgery. I'm like, all right, cool. Like, what kind of surgery? So he says, oh, it's just a minor procedure. I mean, you'll be up. It's outpatient practically, so we'll just do the surgery. You'll get up and you'll walk out the next, like in the next few hours. Oh, awesome. That's great. So I go to the hospital. All of a sudden, they put me in this sheet, and they shave in my abdomen, and they're telling me they're about to put me under. And I'm like, ho, 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 ho. What you mean you put me under? I thought this was going to be a 10-minute deal, and I was going to walk out of here, and they were like, oh, no, like we got to do surgery. So they put me under. Um, this is just a side note about me. I'm real competitive, so I thought that I was going to be able to escape the anesthesia. And so they told me to count down from 10. And when I got to 1, I was like, I made it. And then six hours later, I woke up um, <laughs> because they had done the surgery. And I, and I lost that. Anyway, so when I wake up from the surgery, my wife is in the room with me. I look up at the screen, Walker, Texas Rangers on. I go back to sleep. I remember um, that she came in at one point. The nurse came in. I said, hey, when can I leave? She said, well, we want to make sure you use the bathroom before you go, and we just want to make sure you feel pretty good. So I was like, oh, I got to go. So can I go? She said, yeah. So I, I, I sit up. I turn my legs. I put them down. I, just like normal, I get up. I go to the bathroom, and she looked at me and said, hey, be careful. And I'm like, all right, like for what? Because I think I'm Wolverine, right? And so um, I walk in the bathroom. I use the bathroom. I come back out the bathroom. And I said, hey, can we go now? She said, well, if you're feeling pretty good and you look like you are, yeah, you can go. You just got to sign these papers. I'm reading the papers. They tell me I can't drive. I can't understand why because I'm fine. I'm walking around. I put on my pants just like I normally put on my pants. I put on my shirt just like I normally put on my shirt. I'm walking out the hospital. I remember looking at my wife and saying, I don't know why you can't drive. Like, I feel completely normal. It doesn't even feel like I had surgery. We go to Walmart, which is at that time it was Somerset Hospital. We go to Walmart, which is like, Five minutes from there, eight minutes from there, something like that. My wife says she's going to go into Walmart to get my prescription, which was Tylenol 3. I say, cool, I'm in the car. As I'm in the car, everything on my inside wants to be on my outside. And I feel this absolutely terrible, horrible pain. 
All right. And then I, st- I, I like I try to I saw it climbing the windows. I can't scream because, again, to, to do the surgery, they had to cut my abs. So I couldn't scream. And in one fell swoop, I need you to understand, I had no clue that the anesthesia that they had put in me had not worn off yet. So, like, it started wearing off while my wife is in Walmart. So I'm sitting here thinking, yo, I'm about to die in this car <laughs> because I'm too stupid to recognize I was still anesthetized. Like, I'm sitting, I'm legitimately contemplating my life and going, while she's in there, she's going to come back to the car and I'm going to be dead. All because I... <laughs> Because I did everything when I was an exercise. And so in one fell swoop, I felt all of the pain. Because, you know, you, you, if you've ever done insanity, you know you use your abs to do everything. So to turn my body, I use my abs. To stand up, I had used my abs. To sit down on the toilet, I had used my abs. I used my abs to walk to the car. I used my abs to sit in the car. And I felt every single muscle in my abdomen, it just hurt, right? So this is... So I'm thinking to me, this is how I'm going to die. Not as a missionary in Africa. Uh, not as somebody who was trying to save somebody from some robber or something. I'm going to die in this car from having surgery. You know, I learned something that day, and the Lord spoke to me at that time, which was really cool. Some of us do life the same exact way. We get anesthetized from all of the pain. We don't think about the trauma that we've been through. We don't think about the hurt. We just push it down, push it down, push it down, suppress it. We don't think about it. We don't care about it. It doesn't matter to us because we're going through life anesthetized. We have no clue. But I'm here to tell you, you put that pain on the back burner for so long, it's going to come back to burn you. And when it comes back to burn you, in one fell swoop, you're going to feel all that you have overlooked. I'm here to tell you that there are some of us that are going to be like I am currently. As I look at Judah every single day, all of that stuff that I pushed off and put on the back burner comes back every single day. I'm looking at it every single day, and it's helping me to mourn. It's helping me to lament. It's helping me to be a spiritual beggar. It's helping me to go to God and say, God, I absolutely need you to just get out of bed. Whereas the rest of us are like, hey, I got something to look forward to. So we just hopping up and going on about our business every day to get out of the bed. If If Jesus don't get me out of bed, I don't want to get out of the bed. Last part is hope. Being poor in spirit, being somebody who mourns brings you hope. Why? Because the poor in spirit receive the kingdom of heaven. They receive God's reign and his rule as they beg and cry out to him. Those who lament will be comforted. Why will they be comforted? Because God has made promises that he's going to fulfill and he will never fail. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Since you already are there, just flip back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to show you something in this passage. That was a great reminder to me, and I'm hoping it's a great reminder to you. Verse 1, for we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, talking about the body, we have a building from God, a house that is not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house, in this body, we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven. But if we're going to be honest, a lot of us are not longing to be clothed with our body from heaven. A lot of us are not saying, Lord, even so, Lord, now come. I can tell you, I now write that in my journal on a regular basis. Before Judah got sick, I did not write that one time that I could think of. Never remember even saying that outside of reading Revelation chapter 22. Now, daily, even so, Lord, now come. If you come, man, awesome. And as much as we, having put it on, shall not be found naked. For indeed, while we are in this tent, we groan being burdened because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed in order that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now he who purposed us for this very purpose is God who gave us the spirit as a pledge. Listen, therefore being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body, and to be at home with the Lord. The hope that I have, the confident expectation that I have, because that's what hope is defined as biblically, because, you know, hope is only as good as the promise to which it's tied, and the promise that I have is only sure and certain if it is that God is real and Jesus really did die and Jesus really did rise. I live in the gospel of Saturday, but I understand that Sunday's coming. And considering that Jesus rose, I will, not because of what I've done, but because of faith in his name, his finished work on Calvary's cross, his bloodshed, I will stand in front of him and he will accept me because he's the one who made the promise. 
since I have that hope, according to what 2 Timothy chapter 2 says, my desire then, my goal then is to get away from the things of this world and get into God's presence so that I can get back into the things in this world. If you say, what do you mean by that? What that means is I want to do, I want God to do with me what I did with my son Simeon when he was three years old. We came home from church and my man, uh, we was getting to eat. Refrigerator opens. He looks up. He sees a lemonade Capri Sun. When he saw that lemonade Capri Sun, he saw me see him see the lemonade Capri Sun. He did not think I was going to be good enough of a father to give it to him. So he looked at his mama and he said, mama, I have a secret. I already knew that that meant he didn't want me to hear what he had to say. But three-year-olds can't whisper. So he looked at her and said, may I have that juice, please? As he's saying that, I'm grabbing the juice out. I set the juice on the counter. He looks up and he begins to weep, lament, mourn. And as he's weeping and lamenting and mourning over a lemonade Capri Sun, he looks at me and he goes, Daddy, what are you doing? I said, hey, man, I'm, I'm taking your juice. Why did you take it from me? And, I, and as I'm cutting it open, I said, so I can give it to you. See, for me, I don't know if you like Capri Sun. I like Capri Sun, but I hate the straw. The straw gets on my everlasting nerve. I hate the pouch. Don't make no sense to me. Don't understand how that's a marketing tool. I don't get it. So what I do is cut them bad boys open. I pour the stuff in a cup. Got to cut three or four open to get a nice little gulp. But anyway, so I cut it open. I put it in a cup. I give it to my son so that he can enjoy it in the most satisfying way. And so I take it from him in order that I might give it to him in the most satisfying way. And God has taken some stuff from you to give it to you in the most satisfying way. So instead of you being mad that he took it, what you might need to do is say, thank you for taking that in order that I might receive it the way you want me to have it and not the way that I want to have it. But to do that, that would trust that he's a good, that, that would be us trusting that he's a good father. And some of us have broken relationships with our earthly father that makes God a whole lot harder to trust and a whole lot harder to feel safe with. And so we don't want to trust him with the deepest, darkest thoughts of us, even though we know he knows what they are, because we've read the Old Testament and we're scared to death that if we tell God how we really feel, he's going to open up the ground and swallow us. I'm here to tell you, likely he's not going to do that. What he's more so going to do is let you know that in your weakness, in your brokenness, the gospel is for those who are poor in spirit and the gospel is for those who mourn. In fact, in Psalm 51, verse 17, the Lord says a broken and a contrite heart is what he won't despise. He says the same thing in Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. All through and through, God says something very similar. Uh, in, in James chapter 2, verse 5, he says he's chosen the poor things of this world. He says the same thing in the book of Corinthians. In, in first and in Second Corinthians, he communicates. He chooses those things that are unwise to shame the wise, the things that are foolish to shame those who think they are wise. He uses the weak things to shame the strong. And he continues to do that in my life. He uses the stuff that I'm like, man, I wouldn't do that if I was you. Anytime you say to God, I wouldn't do that if I was you, you got an arrogance problem. So I'm talking to me. I have an arrogance problem because at times I'll go, God, if I was you, well, what does that mean? What that means is I don't really trust him to be as good as he is. But is it possible that in his infinite knowledge, he knows something that I don't know? Yes. As easy as that is to say for every single one of us, if we really believe that, we trust him. If we really believe he was that good, if we really believe he understood, if we really believe he knew, then we would trust him. You wouldn't be sitting here trying to figure out how to get stuff your way. You'd be trusting him to do it for you. You'd be patient. You'd be willing to wait. You'd be willing to learn. You'd be willing to just let him have his way. Why are we not willing to do that? Because at the end of the day, we don't really believe he's as good as he says he is. Father, in Jesus' name, we pray that you would allow us to understand that those who lament, those who mourn, those who are broken, and contrite, those who come to you with a spirit of humility, who recognize that there is nothing they can do to get to you on their own. That is only by your grace reaching out to us. It's only by the blood of your son, just as you show us in the Passover lamb, that you have made the promise that you will pass over if you see the blood. And there are some of us in this room that we say, yes, I've come to know Jesus as Savior, but we are not leaning on him to be poor in spirit and to mourn. We love this earth. We love what the earth has to offer. We are longing for it. We, we hold heaven at an arm's length. And I confess that I've done that. And I still do that. Did it today. So I think about the vehicle that I'm driving. I have an AC. I just pray and ask you in the name of Jesus to remind me 
there are so many things in life that bring us comfort that they just slowly but surely draw us away from you and into our own pride and selfishness and comfort. And it's not that any of those things are wrong in and of themselves, but what we do with them is the issue for you. So, Lord, I've made an idol out of my family. I've made an idol out of ministry. I've made an idol out of my relationships. I've made an idol out of my kids. I've made, a, made an idol out of, out of their success at school. I've made an idol out of the way that they share the gospel with their friends, and that's wrong. I pray and ask your forgiveness, first of all. But then, second of all, I pray that as you just continue to allow us to learn what it means to be poor in spirit, that we wouldn't run from that vulnerability, that we wouldn't run from that disappointment that earth has to offer. You allow us as we lament and mourn, as we are spiritual beggars, to just long for you, to long for heaven, to long for home, and then to see this earth for what it is. It's the invitation. It's not the party, it's not the cake, it's not the icing, it's just the invitation. I pray that you allow us to do that in Jesus' name.